Welcome. Hi, I'm Mickey, and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners, and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness, and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Kia ora team, welcome to the podcast this week. I am Mickey. you are listening to Wikipedia, and this week on the podcast, I get to talk to Dom Harvey. He's a podcaster, former radio DJ, avid runner, and a New Zealand personality, and we talk about how running has transformed his life through some of his most challenging times. Now, Dom, as I said, he's such a great character, and we talk on a range of topics in this podcast, including his training, his time on early morning radio at the edge, his move away from radio, and now as a full-time podcaster, his fertility challenges and how this has impacted him, and importantly, as a runner, he shares his love of running, and that's where we you know, really connect, and so we have a great conversation around all of this stuff, and Anyone that has listened to The Edge or has paid any attention to New Zealand personalities over the years will know Dom Harvey. So usually he's the one asking the questions. So it was a great opportunity to have him on the other side of the microphone. As I said, Dom is a broadcaster, writer and runner. And he was the host up until 2021 of The Edge breakfast show. He has written three best-selling books including Running, A Love Story, which we discuss here in today's podcast, and his career highlights include winning the Sir Paul Holmes Award for New Zealand Broadcaster of the Year. But of course, outside of radio, he is passionate about running. He has run all six of the world marathon majors, and we talk a lot about them, particularly the New York one, which we have also done. And he got to his goal of a sub three marathon at Tokyo, where he ran in at 2.57. And we have a really good conversation around that. In 2018, he also ran five marathons in five days. And in the process, him and his friends at the edge raised a quarter of a million dollars so a young girl could get cancer treatment in Barcelona, which is amazing. And that effort earned him a Kiwi Bank New Zealand Local Hero Award and also an Outstanding Contribution to Radio Award. He's such a great guy and you can find more about him uh, in the show notes where I've got links to his website, his podcast and his books. And before we crack on into the podcast, just like to remind you that the best way for you to support Wikipedia is to subscribe to your favorite podcast platform and share it with your mates because that is a great way for people to become aware of Wikipedia out there in podcast land where there are so many different podcasts. In addition to that, if you want to go the extra mile, sign up to the Recipe Portal Access, where 12 bucks a month gets you a regularly updated recipe library. You can connect in with our private members' Facebook page. You're able to ask me anything nutrition-related through our online platform, and you get to do all things real food nutrition over on mickeywillardin.com. Cool team. Please enjoy this conversation that I have with Dom Harvey. So, Dom, thank you so much for taking the time to chat to me today. Oh, Mickey, th thank you for the invite. I really appreciate it. I love what you're doing. Oh, lovely. So, Dom, you know, it's been not quite a year since you've left the edge, maybe eight, nine months. Is that, would that be about right? Yeah, yeah it was like July, August. How is life uh, not getting up at 4 a.m. like behind a microphone for five hours a day? Life, um, life is, has has been very different, um, but incredibly enjoyable as well. L last night, um, my ex-wife JJ she messaged me with a new show that she recommended on Netflix, so I ended up watching two episodes and went to bed at about ten thirty and woke up this morning naturally, like just before eight a.m. And it's um, after thirty years of doing like breakfast hours radio, twenty of them at the edge, and another ten at a station in Palmerston North. And being like a, a slave to the alarm clock and a slave to the bedtime, it is. I, it, it's an adjustment that I thought would be hard to make, but it's been surprisingly easy. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome! And uh, that show was it like Anatomy of a Scandal or something? Yes. <laughs> yeah. How yeah. did you? 
I, I don't know. We, that's what we're watching right now as well. And it's that kind of show which is very easy to watch an episode, then watch another episode. I think it's just in my head that I uh, that a lot of people are watching right now. It's good, isn't it? Yeah, with um, with Sienna Miller, yeah. But I um, I don't know. I sort of find um, for me to get the best sleep, I need to be watching something like um, I don't know, Marie Kondo or Queer Eye or something, something like this. It's, it's yeah, it's it's very high drama and it sort of winds me up before bedtime. So I'm watching it, thinking I shouldn't be watching this now, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I was enjoying it. Oh, that's good. Hey, um, so Dom, I really want to chat to you today about. Well, about a lot of things, but, you know, predominantly, I feel like we're mates already because we're runners. And, yeah. you know, as soon as you connect with someone and you find it that they run as well, you immediately feel like you sort of know their innermost, mm. I don't know, like the type of person that they are. And I I love running. I think it really connects people. And obviously you do too, to the extent yeah. that you now have a podcast, uh, Runners Only, which um, I've listened to a few episodes and I've loved them. Um, oh, thank you. And I've often thought that it, I find it really difficult to put into words how much I love running, but you go and write a book about it. That's pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and actually, and I love your book as well, Dom. Like it's, it's a book for people of all sort of running, I'd say um, running abilities isn't the right, maybe running experience. It's for the people who are newbies who haven't even really discovered the love of running, if you like. Yeah. But it also has so much for people who are runners because you just intimately connect to a lot of those experiences that you are not shy at all about sharing with us. Um, I don't know. Like, What was hilarious, though, is I downloaded your book. Uh, sorry, I downloaded your book. Um, and it is, you know, running a love story. And one of the first reviews I read about it, sorry, Dom, it gets a one star, uh, from some guy who's like, yeah, well, I thought I'd get some running tips from this, but the first two chapters is all about how much he loves running. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought that was hilarious. Like, hello, you're, the book is a love story about running. And uh, I just thought that was really bloody funny, particularly because actually you share a lot of really good insights for people who are really new to running about the watches that you need or don't need, the type of shoes you might need. You've even got training plans at the end of it. like Yeah, from from my, my coach. Because I, I make it I make it very clear, Mickey, like in, in the book that um, – like this is just my relationship with running. Like if you want to, if you want to get a book that's going to teach you how to be a, a better runner, there's probably people that have won Olympic medals that have written those books. I'm I'm not that person. I'm not very good. I just enjoy it. Yeah. Um, and I'm just sort of sharing the. Some, I suppose with the book and now with the podcast, it's just um sharing some of the richness that running's brought to my life and saying to people, hey, maybe it'll have the same impact on you if you try it out. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. And I interviewed um, Dina Caster a few months ago. And so she's a former Olympian based in the States up in Mammoth Lakes. Yeah, yeah. And um, she, um, she's she got an amazing book as well, which is sort of in the same vein, but it's much more, I guess, a memoir, but also just she is the sort of transformation that can occur when you run, just purely like the what it teaches you about yourself and about how to handle situations and things like that. And she mentioned in her book, which really resonated with me, that when you are on a run with someone and it, you don't even need to know them very well, but suddenly you're just in the depth of these sort of like innermost experiences that they've had. And you really, it's all like almost all barriers are just taken away and you can mm. share your innermost thoughts that you probably wouldn't easily do over a coffee or maybe even with other people who you might be closer to in everyday life. I got a bit of that through your book, Dom. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Oh, that's, that's really good. Yeah, I'm, I must admit, I must admit um, everything you're saying is 100% is accurate. But the, um, the, the reason I got into running is initially is that I like the solo aspect of it. I like the ease and the convenience. I like that I could just um, you know, put my shoes on at whatever time of the day, go out the door and get it done. And then um, it was only later on, like years into my sort of running journey that I sort of discovered the community a bit and started connecting with other people. And it's a it's a pretty cool community. But that, I think that's a cool thing about running. It can be can be a solo thing if that's what you want it to be. Yeah. Or if you, um, you want to connect with others, then it's a very, very open and uh, warm community as well. Yeah, for sure, Dom. So can we chat? Can we start with you sort of just talking to us about why you got into running in the first place? Well, um, it was oh, it was very superficial reasons. I was um, 
Uh, my, my early 30s, I guess, maybe mid-30s, and um, I, I'd put on quite a bit of weight because I, I, I stopped doing like running or any sort of activity for that matter as soon as I left school and then had a wonderful time in my 20s, <laughs> a fantastic time, treated my body like a like an absolute sewage part. <laughs> and then by the time I got to my early 30s, I um, – I was I was just dreadfully unhappy with the way I looked, and particularly when I was when I was naked. It, it was um yeah, I, I didn't I didn't look good, I didn't feel good. I was weighing maybe like a hundred and hundred and ten kilos on the scales, and I, I I just didn't feel good about it. And I I remember I used to run at school, and I used to be lean when I was at school, so I put some shoes on and. I'd, I just started running. I'd, I'd run around the the Hamilton Lake, and it was like five k's, and I'd do that every day, and I'd do it. And, you know, 5Ks, I look back now um, and 5Ks is, is yeah, nothing, nothing for me now. Um, but I'd do this five kilometre loop, then I'd get home, take my shoes off, stand on the scales and be dreadfully disappointed that I hadn't dropped any weight <laughs> in that time, which is absurd. Um, and then somewhere along the, somewhere along the journey, I stopped, I, I, the, the running just made me feel good. Even though I still didn't look good, the running made me feel good and I stopped obsessing about my weight. And then I just kept on running and started running a little bit longer and a little bit further and I felt good about it. And, and then um, one day I just woke up and I realised that, you know, the, the weight that I wanted to lose, I, I had lost. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. And in fact, see, because I only know you, Dom, the runner really, over the last, say, 10 years or so. And mm. and where you are talking about sort of prior to that. And so in your book, you do have like pictures of yourself prior to sort of beginning running and it's almost unrecognisable, actually. And it's not just the additional 20 years of age that you've got on you. It's your, you know, everything about um, how you look is is quite different. Um, I do have to say I loved reading, and I think all Kiwis would love reading, your experiences growing up uh, and, and your running experiences growing up. More so just some of the, some of the classic Kiwi parenting uh, stories that you're kind of sharing about how your dad made you get out of the car and run back to Palmerston North. And uh, Oh, yeah, that was, so, yeah, that was, because um, we're from a, like a, I suppose a running family, like dad, dad ran a couple of marathons, albeit quite slow. And then um, mum got into it and mum, mum still runs now, like she's 70, 71, and she still runs marathons and stuff. So, yeah, this was there was an event called Fielding to Palmerston North, which is held every year, and it's about uh, I don't know 16, 17 kilometers. And uh, we were just me and my um, brother and sisters were just in our pajamas watching What Now, was ever on TV. And Dad's we, we got to go in the car because we're going to Fielding because you know, Mum was doing this run. And then we, we got there, and um, I was like, oh, uh, why couldn't I run? And he goes, well, you can if you want. And I had my pajamas on, I had no shoes. And um, it seems bizarre now, like it's the sort of thing, if you saw, I guess I was eight or nine years old, an eight or nine year old kid in pajamas and bare feet running this um, reason, reasonably substantial distance run, you'd probably call, you know, some child services or something, you'd be asking some questions. <laughs> but uh, that was just how we did it back in the eighties, right? Like, like well, I, was, yeah, I guess so. I read I it; it's so. classic, a classic kind of story. Um, and the running's in your genes, Dom. Like, I was so amazed by what you shared about your mum and yeah. how she's continued to, um, to to run across. Like, because you mentioned that, yeah, that yeah, your dad he did a couple, but actually, your mum's like, hang on, wait, give me a pair of running shoes and I'll uh, go and run a marathon and just wasted his PB um, or his previous time that he did and then subsequently went on to run like these phenomenal times. The fact that she's still running now is, I think that's so inspiring. Yeah, oh, it, it honestly is. Like she, she runs most days. She's um, she's done, um, there, there's a series called the World Marathon Majors and there's um, six of them. So there's um, like Boston, New York, London, Berlin, Tokyo, and Chicago, and she's done. She's done five. When, and when you've done all six of them, you get this um, thing called a six star finisher medal, which is a, a, a hideous piece of piece of junk, um, but represents a whole lot of work. And she's done five of them, and the only one uh, left to do for Mum is Boston. And she's, um, you know, she has been meant to go for the last couple of years, but you know, due to the pandemic, she hasn't. So she's, um, she's sort of worried that she's running out of years. <laughs> but no. I've got no doubt that, you know, next year she will get that done. Yeah, she's, she's fantastic. And she still, 
She'll do it in under like four and a half hours, which is a reasonable time, I think, for a marathon for anybody of Mate, any age. That is, that is phenomenal. So um, I'm well familiar with the um, six sort of world major uh, marathons. I've, I've done New York. So yeah, that, good. Did you oh, love it? Mate, it was phenomenal. We arrived there injured as, you know, you, as a runner, you're either coming off an injury, about to get injured, or you're injured, right? Like there's, there's, that, that's the continuum. Um, yeah. And so I was coming off an injury, really bad tendonitis or tendinopathy in my hamstring, but we had qualified the year before at Auckland um, and there was no way we weren't going to do it. Uh, so, and it was, it was the most phenomenal marathon I've ever done because it was my first big one. So prior to that, I, I mean, I've done the New, New Zealand ones and a couple of Australian ones, but nothing compares to the big city feel of of that uh, New York marathon. And I couldn't believe it, Dom. I don't, I'd love to hear how your take on it, but the whole city got behind the marathon. And I thought when I arrived, no one would care at all. Like, this is this massive city. Why would they care about these people running through the five boroughs? But, mate, I felt like I was winning the marathon. The, the amount of support that we got um, the entire way was amazing. Yeah, that's, that's hilarious. That's a really good observation because uh, you, 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 actually, you actually find that with all the all the six world marathon majors and uh, they're all, they all sort of attract about 50,000 people, I guess. And uh, you compare it to, say, the, the Auckland Marathon, which is a, a massive event in New Zealand, and they re re reluctantly shut, like, one lane of the bridge for a couple of hours in the morning, um, and motorists get pissed off because they can't go along Tamaki Drive. Um, but, yeah, over there in, in New York or, or um, Boston's even better for this, I think. Um, yeah, the whole city gets in behind and supports it. If you walk, if you wander around after the event with your medal on, people like people, everyone knows what it's about, and everyone affords yeah. you, and you get free beers and places. Yeah, it's. It, oh, I'm getting goosebumps actually just thinking about it. it it's is. such a special event, and I mean, Mickey, here we are, like connecting on two little screens talking about running. Imagine being, you know, in the, the race area before a race starts, and you're with fifty thousand other like-minded people, oh, yeah. people that have that have got, got the same nerves as you. They've gone through the same few months of intense training. Yeah, um, it's just a bonding experience that's like no other. Ah, oh, I completely agree. And you know, I was really a little bit nervous sort of arriving to to do the marathon like we arrived there on like Friday morning and the race is on Sunday but we know that this is no PB event you know we're just there to, to sort of um, participate and stuff and and I was a bit anxious at the idea that you had to jump on a bus about five hours before the marathon started <laughs> and I'm like what the heck like where are we going and it's going to be freezing but then we get there and they've like, got bagels they've got bagels and coffee and they've got little beanies which and you Dunkin mentioned. Donuts yeah, yeah, yeah. Don yeah it's like Fantastic. Um, and then after the event, you get given your big sort of hoodie type blanket thing. You're walking through these really crowded streets. Everyone is congratulating you. And you're right. Like people, when we sort of did the touristy thing for a few days afterwards before jumping back on a plane, people were still wearing their medals like two or three days later. And people were still giving them um, congratulatory sort of like high fives and, and things like that. Because it is such a special event. And in part, I feel like because of the the increase in, in popularity of both the marathon, but then the ultra marathon, and if you sort of extend it to other endurance sports, people now sort of go, oh, I've just done a marathon. Like it's no big deal. But it is such a big deal, actually. Yeah. Oh, it, absolutely it is. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Humans are strange like that, how the events just get longer and longer. You know, I, I've, um, I wouldn't mind trying some sort of ultra distances, but I, like, I don't think I'd be keen to go more than like 100 k's. Like 100 miles doesn't really interest me. 24-hour um, runs sound no. awful. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, the marathon is absolutely nothing to, nothing to scoff at. And to, to anyone that's um, watching or listening to this that um, hasn't, done like a full marathon yet or is maybe considering it or isn't sure I, you should definitely do it because it is very very achievable with a bit of work and when you finish when you cross the finish line in your first ever marathon you just have this euphoric feeling that washes over you that nothing you put your mind to in life is impossible anymore yeah I don't know it's uh, I got I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it but you just feel like okay well that was a really really big thing that I achieved and if I can do that then I can do other stuff and I find later on down the track, um, it, it transfers to other areas of your life as well. When things get tough, you're like, okay, well, things got tough in the marathon and I got through that. And, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I agree. It's completely transformational. And you do such a good job of talking about the, I guess, suppose the learning that you got through the training for your sub three. And mm. I've got to say, as I was reading your book, hearing about your training, and you you cover it in quite a few chapters. And by mm. the end, I'm just like, oh, my God, is he actually going to do the sub three in Berlin or not? Um, subsequently, you didn't. However, I did. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, uh, <laughs> I did. I have your updated version. So I know that you are in that sub three club now. So yeah. that's, you know, that's amazing. But to run a marathon is one thing, but to run sub three, Dom, that's mm. phenomenal, actually. And yeah. it takes a lot of work. So let me share with you um, a an anecdote. Um, my mate, he's uh, like a former Olympic kayaker. And he has also done Ironman. He's like, you know, an awesome athlete. And so yeah. he sort of retired from after Beijing. and was like, right, I'm going to do a marathon. He's like, well, if Mickey can do sub three, well, I think I'll be able to do sub three. And uh, so he did, obviously he trained a bit. And then I got a call up, I think maybe 11 a.m. on the marathon day, Auckland marathon day, and I wasn't in Auckland. And he's like, my God, Mickey, I'm so sorry. I had absolutely no idea how bloody tough it is to do sub three. I didn't do it. And I have so much more respect for you now <laughs> that you did it. It is it is hard yards to sort of go that extra distance. And you, like me, actually, and probably like a lot of us, were sort of like on the cusp of sub three for so long. Mm. You just have to keep on going. Yeah. You wonder if it's a, uh, if it's a, what's your best time, by the way? What did you do? Can't believe you don't know this, Tom. Uh, <laughs> just jokes. Two fifty-five in Auckland. Oh wow, that's awesome! Yeah, it was ages ago. Like it was like two thousand and ten. Uh, so yeah, a while. Yeah, ago. no, that's um, that's not just breaking three hours. That's smashing it. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, do, do you think um, do you think like anybody is capable of like running a sub three marathon, or do you st- do you think you need like a certain natural sort of fitness in the beginning? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I don't think that a sub three is inevitable for everyone. No way. Like mm. it is like I think potentially sort of you mentioned four hours, four and a half hours, that is still a decent mm. time. And I'm impressed yeah. if I if, if anyone goes out and runs their first marathon, um, sort of three thirty to four hours, I'm actually I'm super impressed with that because it takes that takes a sort of like a natural sort of um uh I think that person will have that more natural sort of ability. But to run sub three, I think there's a reason why um that's a sort of goal for a lot of people who are pretty decent runners because it is it's hard. Mm. Yeah, I um yeah, because I, I talk about this in the in the book quite a bit. Um so I was just running sort of on my own, just printing programs out off the internet and I was sort of running Around about three three hours fifteen. That was sort of the the time I was sort of running, you know, all within like a couple of minutes, regardless of what I did differently. Then I teamed up with a coach, and um, I said, "This is the big goal I want." And we worked on it for years and years and years. And to be honest, that that when I did it in Tokyo a few years ago, I did it um, two hours fifty seven. The the training was bloody hard. It was mm. really hard, and it, a lot of it was quite unenjoyable. I mean, the feeling I got when I you know, crossed the finish line in under three hours and achieved this goal I've been working for for years. That was an amazing feeling. But, the, yeah, the training was um, – like I'd open up the app and have a look at the run for that day and uh, I'd sort of shrug my shoulders, you know, and feel, oh, my God, I don't, you know, and it was like that for months. And at the end of the um, the Tokyo, I did a sort of, um, sort of a, a debrief, I guess, and I thought – Honestly, in my in my heart of hearts, I could probably go a little bit quicker, like maybe mm. two fifty six, two fifty five, two fifty four. But I thought for the extra training required, and the, knowing the work that goes into it, would it bring me enough joy? And the answer was no. So yeah, interesting. Since then, I've sort of like bagged off a bit. So I think I'm a one and done in the sub three club. Yeah, and you know what? Like, you don't need to do any more, right? Like, I found for me, like I sort of lingered around three oh one to three. I think three oh I did maybe three or four marathons at that three oh one pace. And I was and it was actually so prior to doing my two fifty five in Auckland, I'd six weeks beforehand went to Sydney to run um a sub three. And I was like all of my friends around me were like, Mickey, of course you're going to do it, but I just didn't believe it until I did it. And in fact I was running with the paces, they were too slow. I had to I had to at about 30k to go I was like mate I've got to split because you guys are just going to get me another 301 and I've been there and have you done Sydney Dom? 
<laughs> no, no, I haven't done Sydney at all. Is it, was, is it a flat course? Or? Oh, yeah, 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 it's yeah. flat, except they'd changed the course on the year that I did it. And, I mean, this was 2010, so I'm not sure if it's different now, but you had to do a number of dog legs to make up oh. the sort of oh. the 42. And then you run past the finish line at 30K, and then you have to do a loop out and back, and it is like – tumbleweeds out there there is no one like everyone yeah. is is around the finish but I got in at sub three and it felt amazing and uh listen to me I'm here interviewing you about running telling you all about my running but anyway um and then at Auckland six weeks later I was only going to run sort of sub three pace for half of it because I wanted to pace a friend um so you know Les Mills Victoria Park Yes, yeah. Yeah, so my sort of introduction to running in Auckland, Widamu, um, is a Widamu Jones is like ex Navy, he'd do run club Wednesday and Friday. And for a lot of us doing that, they were like our marathon distance every single week. Not because mm. it was a distance, sorry, but that was the competition. So this mm. guy was always faster than me there. So I thought, right, well, I'll pace you for a sub three marathon. We'll do half of it. And then I thought I'd just like, just jog. I don't know why you think this. Just jog the rest of the marathon because, you know, that'll be so easy. <laughs> uh, and then at a 20K, he was just like, oh, no, nah, I'm out. And I was still at that sub three pace. I'm just like, oh, I'm just going to continue on. And I think it actually, Dom, the psychological barrier of sub three had been removed because I knew that I could do it. And now it was just a matter to see how much more quickly I could do that marathon in. That was a very long story to tell you that. Uh, no, no, that's a, that's, a, that, that's a great time for Auckland. Like the, uh, the first half of Auckland, it's quite, it's pretty hilly. It it's is. It's deceptively hilly. Yes. The, um, the, the Harbour Bridge climb, it goes on for way longer than what you think it's going to. So go you, that's awesome. Oh, thanks, Dom. That's um, brilliant. Now, can we chat about your, um, kind of your health history actually because like you describe it in, in a lot of detail in the book but you were about to begin the Auckland Marathon or you had just begun the Auckland Marathon <laughs> yeah. and then you ended up being taken away in an ambulance yeah it was um it, it was it was, a, it was a, a crazy thing so this is a few years after I'd started running um so I wasn't I wasn't very serious at, at, at the time um I just found I'd go out for runs and as soon as I tried to introduce any sort of speed work, faster runs, or go up a hill, I'd just feel sick, and I'd I'd be grey in the face, and sometimes I'd be curled over on the side of the road, like vomiting, and then I'd have to walk home. But by the time I got back home, I felt fine again. And I I just kind of put it down to, like I suppose getting older and being unfit and starting exercise again. I, I look back down. I, I was a, can I swear? Yeah. I was a fucking idiot. I I mean, I, you know. Of course, it wasn't wasn't a natural sort of health thing. Like, mm. what a dumb, not every time I ran, but you know, maybe once every couple of weeks. And in the end, uh, JJ, who I was married to, she said, "You you need to go to the doctor and like get this get this looked at." So I went to a doctor, and the doctor put me onto a cardiologist because I thought it was a heart thing. And they they were starting to run some tests and do some things, but they had, really had no idea what it was. Mm. Then um, I was in the Auckland Marathon, and I was like four k's into it, so like. 10% of the way through a run, <laughs> you know, so the run, as you know, Mickey, it hasn't even started at that point. And um, we were running past, um, I think, Takapuna Grammar School, and there's the first drink station there, and there was a St. John's there. And I was feeling like ass at that time. And it was the feeling that I'd had in training numerous times before. So I thought, um, I'm, I'm going to pause my watch. It's going to ruin my time for the event, but this is my chance to see if they can do some tests or whatever, like in real time while this thing's going on. So I stopped at the um, St. John's Ambulance. I, I said, oh, I've got this thing. Sometimes when I run, I feel sick and it's happening now. Do you guys want to like get some blood or something? And they, they just put the, um, the blood pressure sleeve on me, pumped it up. And then the, the young guy that did it, he was like, oh, that, that doesn't look right. So he did it again. And then I could, he said, excuse me for a minute. I could hear him out. I, I could, couldn't hear what he was saying, but I could hear him outside like talking to a supervisor. So then the supervisor came in and did it again. And they were like, holy shit. So I forget what it was, but it was like like almost like double what it should have been. So they, they thought I was in the middle of having a stroke or something. But the, the thing is, like, by, by that time, I'd been on the ambo for yeah. like 10 minutes. So I felt fine again, like like I'd, I said with all my runs, you know, I sort of came right again. I was like, oh, I'll, I'll just finish the run and then I'll I'll come and see you guys afterwards. And they're like, no, you're you're lying down. And then they, they had the sirens on and <laughs> it was um, it felt quite dramatic because I was, I was, I felt fine. That's sort of my race number pinned on me. But <laughs> anyway, they, they kept me in hospital, hospital for tests and things. And it turns out it was um, yeah. this, 
this um, benign tumour that was growing in my um, like abdomen area, like a, a nine centimetre like ball of um, whatever it was, just yeah. going. Can, yeah. They they removed it and, and it was a game changer. I, I was running for the first time in my life like without this thing that was holding me back. That, like I don't even know how you can have a tumour that large and not no, because at that stage you were you you had sort of transformed physically as well as a runner. You know, yeah, like, yeah. It's so... I mean, I still had a little bit of a little bit of like weight on the gut, I guess, but nothing nothing too major. But yeah, it was it was well hidden in there. Like they they were doing like ultrasounds and MRIs mm. and all sorts of stuff before they found it. It was crazy. It was crazy. Like I, I could you couldn't you could there was no like noticeable lump or you couldn't feel it or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was it something to do with your adrenals or like adrenaline yeah, or yeah. something, wasn't it? Yeah, like the, the adrenal glands thing. So that's, um, well, yeah, there, there were other things that would, hap- would happen that I didn't even, it, it just didn't occur to me to be abnormal. So say, say I was in traffic and someone cut in front of me, suddenly I'd be, I'd have sweat, you know, dripping off me and I'd be shaking for like 10 minutes. And yeah. it was because th- this tumour would like flood my system with adrenaline. Jeez. So, so I was <laughs> I was running on edge the the whole time, and uh, as soon as it was taken out, I became like sort of more more peaceful and zen, and I didn't realize it was <laughs> <laughs> it was this thing that had been like I suppose because it got to that size, like they said it probably started as like a pea size thing and just yeah, grew yeah. over the years. Yeah. So it was just progressively getting worse. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's crazy, but um. Unfortunately, yeah, it, it left me with a. Oh, yeah, this, well, this was a funny story. So, so they took the tumor out, and I was you know, recovering in, in Auckland Hospital. And the surgeon that, that took it out, and uh, it was a long operation, like eight or nine hours. He came in to see me, and he asked for a private word. And uh, my mum and JJ, who, my wife at the time, they were in the room with me, and so they're like, "Okay, we'll leave you to it." So they 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 left the little cubicle thing, and he put the curtain around, and then so. But they can hear everything right outside because it's a mm. curtain. Um, and he's like, oh, yeah, we, we got the tumour out successfully, but um, uh, a side effect of this may mean you have a condition now called retrograde ejaculate, which means mm. when you have sex, um, everything feels the same and works the same, but nothing comes out at the end. Mm. And he said, this is, I realise you guys don't have kids, so if you want to have kids, this could be a problem. But he said, but fertility treatments come a long way. It's real easy now to harvest the sperm and where you go. So... JJ and Mum came back in, and I was like, oh, "Did you did you hear?" They said, "Yeah, we heard everything, so that's fine." Um, but then that started like a seven or eight year fertility journey, and we realised, "Oh, that surgeon, he may have been good at taking tumours out of people, but he knows jack shit about fertility and how it works." Oh, mate. Um, so, but, but the funny thing is, Mickey, like through that that high, whole process, like I I can't I've sort of blocked it out now. I can't even tell you how many rounds we had. Maybe six or seven rounds of IVF, and yeah, yeah. then a couple of rounds of um. Uh, uh, another another form of treatment with a with a with a donor sperm, and then we just we just sort of gave up after that because we just felt broken. Mm. But I think running, yeah, um, yeah, running definitely helped through that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think for like for, for for JJ, like she got quite depressed. Yeah, you know, yeah, because for running, like, because JJ's a runner too, isn't she? Like she's. She's done two half marathons, but absolutely no, she is not a runner. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I think I must have overstated that a little bit just with, yeah. with what you shared. And I think that's the thing with um, with running is it really sort of, I've, I've heard someone sort of describe it before, is that you sort of, you're left open to your feelings and your thoughts, you know, these sort of almost nowhere to hide from them when you're out mm. there running, which, which in some ways... I, you know, it's such a good stress relief for a lot of people and for that. And that's actually what I thought when I was reading your experience, Dom. And I know that you've, you know, you've shared it like in your job as a, um, a radio host and stuff as well, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's such a, uh, I suppose a good way. It doesn't take away the hurt, but it, it must allow at least in some part for you to sort of process it a little bit or I don't know. Mm, I think so. Go. I was getting quite emotional just before just talking about it. I think um, mm. I don't know. I, I feel like as I get older, um, it, it becomes almost harder to talk about. Because as I get older, I, you know, you think, okay, this is how much I wanted kids. And actually, the, the very last time we went um, for fertility treatment, there were some other friends of ours in the waiting room at the same time. Um, uh, Jay and Anna Reeve, who have got like a couple, uh, twin twin boys, and the, the funny yes. thing is. Like whenever I see them, and they're, they're a great family, um, so they, that was their very first attempt at IVF, and it was our very mm. last. So whenever I see them now, and I see their kids on Instagram and stuff, I'm like, huh, okay, 
Yeah. yeah if, I, if I had kids, that's how old they'd be. So you just realise you're going into the second half of the slide, half of your life with a, a way that you saw it playing out that's not going to play out anymore. And it's, um, yeah, it's still quite hard to process. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so sometimes I'm thankful. Like if I'm on a if I'm on a plane and there's a screaming kid next to me, or yeah, you're at the uh, the supermarket and someone's having a tantrum because they can't get a kind of surprise. I think <laughs> my life's pretty good, but then you realise there's a lot of other stuff that you are missing out on. Yeah, no, look, I completely appreciate what you're saying, Dom. Um, you have a you have a a son though, right? Kind of. Yeah, we had a we had a um, a family adoption. Um, yeah, JJ's. JJ's biology, JJ's um, brother had a son and uh, he, he, he's a bit of a rat bag, JJ's brother, and he was in and out of jail for mainly for drug offences, not, not nothing violent or anything, but made a lot of poor, poor life choices. So when he was, when his son, Savin, uh, was four and 11 months, Michael was recalled to go back to jail for breaking parole or something. And we, at the time, we, we were living in a, a big house with spare rooms. And I said to JJ, I don't think I could live with myself if we didn't take this kid in because everyone else in the family had washed their hands with him. Um, mm. JJ's father was like, what are you doing? You don't want to mess with Michael's kid. Like, you know, because he just, because of his drug use, had just sort of shat on everybody in the family. Everybody had washed their hands with him. And I said to JJ, I mean, it's it's not this kid's fault. So it was either us or it was going to be like a, a Sif's home or whatever. Mm. So, so, so we took him in and, uh, yeah, it ended up it ended up turning a little bit sour, but I, I I've got no regrets about it because we learned we learned so much and we did absolutely everything we could. But yeah, me and JJ ended up having a, a lot of a lot of um, therapy because at, at that age, four years and eleven months, mm. they can't do a lot of therapy with the kids, but they can, you know, um, speak to the caregivers and stuff. So we learned so much about you know brain development, and it turns out that eighty percent of a child's brain development is done in the first thousand days or three ish years. Yes. Um, so. So he was already he was already a bit broken by the time he came to us, and yeah, the whole um, nature versus nurture thing. It's like we 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 did everything we could, but in the end, he was going to sort of cut his own path. But thankfully, yeah. like he's he's nineteen now, and he, he's touch wood, he's never been in jail or anything. And you know, he's I don't know, he's he posts some weird stuff on Instagram, but he seems like he's just a, <laughs> just harmless. So I, I, I said to JJ now, it's like. I feel like we've done a good job because I, yeah, I think yeah. his path would have been a lot worse than what it is had he not had those, you know, 14 years with us. Yeah, totally. And I feel like that it's such a selfless thing to do, Dom. I think like my sister's in a similar situation with her her son's son, actually. So mm-hmm. she's yeah. of a, she's she's your age. Um, she's had her children and now she's caring for, um, for Tamariki. And I think that it, it just strikes me as like one of the most selfless things that you can do actually to take on board a child who might otherwise not have the the nurture that they required, at, you know, regardless of that, uh, of sort of what's gone on before, like setting them in that right sort of path. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think Savin still has, I think he still has this mentality that uh, you know you guys you guys stole me from my dad or whatever. But um, it's like, well, actually, the Department of Corrections stole your dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, all our friends say, oh, one one day he's going to come back and go, oh, thank you guys for what you did. But I don't know, I can't see it happening. But it's not a, it's not about that anyway. Um, no. But I, you just want to see him do well because we we know he's a good kid and we know how much potential he's got. Yeah. Um, and you just want to see it. that's all you want, are you want want to see them reach their potential absolutely i'm a stepmom they say that a lot all my friends say the same thing to me as well don't worry mickey they'll figure that out they'll figure out the influence you had in their life when they're yeah. adults and i'm like sure. <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't know Maybe about they, that really do, do, you, do you do you have any of your own kids or no you're just a stepmom no just a stepmom yeah well, is that yeah. my choice or uh no no so it's yeah. well it's circumstance isn't it you know you sort of go through life thinking things will happen because things just happen because because life is that you finish university, you get married, you yeah. buy a house, you have children, you have a career, you have it all. But life sort of works like that for maybe, you know, a small percentage of us. So um, by the time that Barry and I got together, I was 39. So right. it had, and he'd had two children and one of them was a teenager. So it wasn't really... It wasn't in our future to have children together, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How, are you, how are you with that? You at peace with that? That takes time, I yeah. think. Uh, and I would say that had you asked me that even probably two years ago, it would I 
I couldn't have said that I am at peace with it, but I think now I am. Mm. Yeah, but I guess sort of probably like you, Dom, you sort of have these periods of time where you, I don't know what if it's you just get tired or something sort of sparks in you and you'll just, you have that sort of emotional um, reaction to other people's children or something mm. like that. And you think, oh, I thought I was over. I thought that was, you know, I thought I didn't feel that way anymore, but I don't know. Yeah. I think, well, I think, I, yeah, I think most, mostly I'm okay with it. There's just moments where you just, you and I suppose, I suppose even people with kids do this. You have moments where you wonder how how different your life would look if you if it went down a different path. But yeah. I suppose the, the thing is, like a lot of people choose not to have kids, and that's that's perfectly mm. fine, and that's their decision. But where it feels like when that decision is sort of like in my case taken out of your hands, or in your case just with circumstantial stuff, just didn't end up sort of you know falling that way. It's um yeah, it's a bit of a different sort of proposition. Yeah, mm. it is. And so then you just focus on the other things in your life that you love. And, and yeah. like you say, like you don't have to put up with screaming children, which is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, Dom, now um, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. now, are there any pseudonyms in your book? Pseudonym? What is a pseudonym? Like a fake name for someone who didn't want, you didn't want to mention their real name, so you just put a fake name in there, like oh. the dental hygienist. Oh, what did I say her name was in the book? Well, you said her name was Diane, and then oh, I, yeah, that's a pseudonym. Yeah, oh, I thought it was. Actually, yeah. I, I um, uh, I can probably mean ah, uh, ah, uh, Lth. I uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was. I knew it was. <laughs> as soon as I read it, I was sitting there reading it, and I'm like, I'm like, Bez. LTH features in Dom's book, <laughs> but he's put it as Diane. I'm like, that is not, that is so the LTH. How many dental hygienists who are amazing runners do you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I think anyone yeah. in the running community that read the book would have, and, and knows her, would have uh, connected the dots. But yeah, I don't know. Totally. I don't, to be honest, I don't think she would have even, even minded. I should have just reached no, out. No, no. Yeah. yeah, no, I She's don't think great. so. She is. I, I, I love her so much. She's oh, she's yeah. an epic human. She's so so kind and supportive and generous and does so much and you know cheerleading in the in the running sort of sphere. I completely agree. And we had a period of time where we used to train together. Um, she had she this was I get the the years sort of go, and I can't remember what year it was, but we were both training for the Lydiard um, out west. Oh yeah, and, yeah. And um, and she had won it the year previous, and it wasn't her year. The year that we both ran it, um, I think she. I mean, she still came fourth, which was amazing. Um, but I remember her sharing the story that you shared in your book um, about the that the yeah the uh, the defecation situation. Issues. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I had the same thing happen to me, Dom, Christchurch. Did so you? 2010, went down. It was freezing. It was, like, so cold. And I did what you shouldn't do on race day. I did something new. So four – sorry, okay, I'll just take a couple of steps back. So I went out and I won Rotorua Marathon in, 20, in 2005, which was amazing. And um, awesome. I, I had, like, five jam buns, an orange juice, and a banana before going out. Like, I really hit those cards hard. Mm. And uh, so five years later, wanting to go my first sub three, we realized, me and my mate Grant, um, he's, uh, a, he's, he's a professor and he's, you know, a very smart guy. We thought, well, carbs are the limiting factor, so you just need to get in more carbs. Mm. So I'm like, right, I'm going to have a gel every half hour and I'm going to have uh, dried apricots in my porridge. Terrible idea. <laughs> and then, you know, all the other things. So I got into the the marathon at about 25k I'm like oh I really need to stop for a portaloo it was not and I thought oh, I'll just hold on a little bit worst decision ever oh then when I really needed it I couldn't find one and so probably would have gone sub three then but I had to actually I there's no way I was going to cross the finish line I'm like no way so I dipped out at like 40k and I uh, hit uh, somewhere on Hagley Park and then somehow got these strangers to take me back to my hotel. It was so embarrassing. Oh they just threw out my running gear and went, oh, God, had to call my <laughs> friends and go, no, nah, I didn't finish. But, uh, yeah, those situations, man. But there are things that runners can sort of like, you can sort of say things like that and have those stories when you're a runner. Cause oh, poo stories, yeah. It's yeah, just part yeah. of I it. Mean, 
uh, it becomes um, just a very primal sort of thing. I, I remember being at the, um, the, the in the starting corral of the Chicago Marathon, and I'd, I'd, already, I'd been to the Portaloo a couple of times, but you're in this corral for like half an hour, so I thought, I'm going to need to go again. And I was like, I, I don't know what the fuck I can do. Like, there's thousands of people around me. And then there were there were these two women just behind me, and one of them was saying, here, tie my jacket around and then squat. So this this lady, she, she just like squatted down behind me with a jacket around her and was pissing in the gutter. So I was like, oh, it's on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's on. <laughs> they sort of yeah, and um, and it's fine. And, and sure enough, no one no one blinked an eyelid. Like uh, I don't know. I think everyone that's running sort of understands that it could be them or yeah, totally. Know. Yeah, no, I agree. And in fact, I remember running at my um, run group that I was just telling you about earlier, and just running along. And you know, you just do that kind of snot hock where you just like close one nostril and you yeah. hock it out the other one. And I did that. And this was like one of my first runs with these groups when I when I moved to Auckland in two thousand and four. And um, one of the guys was like, oh, my God, Mickey, you're a girl. What are you doing? And I'm like, mate, I'm a runner. Like, there's no there's no difference in gender there. That's just what you yeah, do, right? Yeah, yeah. But you've got to remember not to do that when you're walking along in normal sort of like daytime hours. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, the time problem. And place. It's yeah. like, like, like urinating in the gutter in Chicago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Time and place. Um, yeah. yeah there's, well, there's, there's a, a famous clip on uh, YouTube of Paula Radcliffe, one of the greatest yes. runners of all time, like just stopping in an event, maybe in the Olympics or something, and just um, like pulling her shorts to the side and, and going wheeze in the gutter. Yeah. Um, and then just like, yeah, she's there for like 50, loses like 15 seconds or whatever, but then boom, she's off again. I know, and, amazing. Uh, it's un- unfortunate for her because obviously, you know, she's the world's best runner at the time, and there's cameras on her. And, you know, thankfully, you didn't have cameras on you in Hagley Park. <laughs> no, and in fact, um, I was thinking about Paula Radcliffe as I decided to drop out, thinking I'm no Paula Radcliffe, so there's no like there's no way that I'm going to have photos of me going through that finish line, uh, looking the way that I did. Um, so, Dom, <laughs> you've done all six major marathons. Mm. What's your favourite? Do you have one? It's, it's so hard, eh? So it's so hard to say. I mean, Tokyo's. Uh, was the last one, and that's a favourite because that's the one where I broke three hours. Mm. Um, Boston is is a special one because it's you know you have to qualify to enter, and it's you know one of the world's oldest, most prestigious marathons. But then there's New York, you know, mm. New York. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you 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 described it before, and I was getting goosebumps. It's like um, you know, just the whole thing, like uh, the logistics of getting fifty thousand people to the start line. You do have to be there like five hours beforehand. But you don't actually mind it because it's, there's just this buzz and this hum, and then when you start running, that that buzz and hum continues. And whatever pace you're running, it's um, you, there, there's thousands of other people, you know, just plodding along beside you, and it's the most it's the most amazing. Ex- New York, there, there's your answer, yeah, New yeah. York. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And in fact, you mentioned Boston, and it's been on my agenda to to run a qualifying time to get there. So, mm-hmm. so this. The great thing is, so Dom, as you age, that time just gets a little bit slower. So yeah, you feel yeah. slightly more comfortable. So um, I'm 45 this year and my age qualifying time is like three hours 50. And that's still a decent time for a marathon, but it mm. should be achievable if I just yeah. put in some decent training to then go do Boston in like 2024. Because that's sort of the, the um, it was in fact, it was on TV today, actually. Um, mm. uh, it's the one that's sort of just been in my head, but. I mean, London must be amazing. Berlin has got I, is amazing. So um, I totally yeah want to yeah. In, in some ways, so um, Berlin's the was my first like real red hot crack at breaking three hours. I think I ended up doing like three hours five or three hours six or something, which was a, a personal best, but a long mm. way off breaking three hours. So I um I look back on that and I I. I can't even remember much about the run or running mm. through the streets of Berlin, which is quite sad. So in some ways, you know, I was so busy chasing this time goal. I didn't sort of enjoy enjoy the event. Obviously, like I remember, you run through the Brandenburg gates, like just 300 metres from the finish line, which is just, you know, these gates that are just steeped in history. So I, I remember that. That's amazing. But I remember running through them feeling obviously happy and elated that the marathon was over, but also a bit bummed out that I was so far off my time goal. Um you know, I, I'd, I'd really like to go back and maybe do some of those events again and just um, sort of plod around and enjoy it a bit more, you yeah. know, pause. Maybe, you know, you see people running with GoPros or phones or whatever, maybe be that person and, you know, take some photos of the buskers or, you know, just enjoy it and soak up the atmosphere a bit more. Yeah, totally. And I really felt for you in that, um, as you described that experience, and p- particularly because you went 
with you by yourself, you know, like when you're there mm-hmm. to like sort of like chase a dream, essentially, you know, get your goal. Like in my head, if that was me, I'd always want someone there to be able to share the moment or at least commiserate in the moment in person. So I felt lonely for you actually when I was reading that. Yeah, yeah, because you get over there and you uh, you realise um, how few people speak English. <laughs> so yeah. uh, it's quite a, yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah, I was hoping for a couple of days without speaking to someone and then, um, you know, I, I couldn't get much time off work, so I didn't have a long time before, uh, yeah, before the race. So I wasn't sleeping very well at night, so mm. I was sort of out of sorts a little bit. But, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it would have been much better to have someone there with me, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, and, Dom, so you did mention that you've just sort of been, you've been running. Are you not training for anything right now? Do you have anything sort of? I suppose, in the next year that you're wanting to target or are you just sort of settling into uh, life as it is? Um, no, well, I'm, I'm, um, I've got a deferred entry for the uh, Kepler Challenge, which is later this year, which is 60 Ks. Yes. Um, the last couple of years I've been uh, signed in to do the Old Ghost Ultra, which is like 89 Ks in the Hokitika way, um, but due to COVID that hasn't gone ahead. So I suppose I'm going to have to start logging some miles and getting my body so. ready for that. But, yeah, that's sort of the next goal. Like, um. I realised how difficult it was to get myself to go fast enough to run sub three. So I think now the goal is to just do longer distances at a slower pace. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm. I did Kepler this year. Did and you? Yeah, it was amazing. Like mm. it was so hot, um, but not hot. At, like it was re- like, you know how hot the summer was. And in fact, yeah. down in Tiana, it's funny, like in Auckland, you know it's going to be a great day at like seven o'clock. Whereas in Tiana, it's like 11 o'clock and I'm in a shop and the lady's like, I think it's going to be a nice day just because it takes so much longer for the sun to rise in the heat. (laughs) Do you know? I'm like, oh, really? But it's like, so the actual event was, I mean, it was spectacular. It was so Mm. good. Uh, But, you know, after about 40K, I think I was fit for 40K. But it's really difficult to get yourself sort of beyond that, particularly with what we went through with the pandemic, like events being kept yeah. trained and then they're off, they're trained and then they're off. Um, but it was amazing. You'll love it. Yeah, I, I can't wait. Yeah, I did the uh, the, the Rootburn Classic last year, which is um, uh, about 33 Ks, but it's quite technical and stuff. And I, I just loved it. The tr- there's something really magical about the trails, eh? Mm, oh, totally. So good. And um, with trail running as well is that there's, you know, no requirement to run actually like you can walk and that's still a legitimate part of your training and i love that about trail running as well well yeah well, some, some of the hills are, are so technical and so steep that you you know you may as well save your energy and just walk yeah totally so have you got um coach ian helping you with that yeah he's he's still doing my program i haven't uh, yeah, yeah yeah we need to sit down actually and <clears throat> work out the goals he's just had, I've, i had covid about a month ago so he's had me mm. in a sort of holding pattern for the last month of uh, and uh, advised me like not to run for about three weeks afterwards because of yeah. the, the risk of um, getting long COVID or something. Yeah, yeah. So I've been sort of sneaking out for 10Ks most days just because oh. just, well, just it makes me feel good, you know, mentally as well as physically. Yeah. But, yeah, just, just sort of at a plodding pace, so not even looking at the, the watch sort of thing, which has been really nice. Yeah, no, that is really nice. Um, I have to say I – I think Coach Ian is a bit tough on people he coaches if he makes them go out and run 20 minutes before doing a marathon. Like, Coach, <laughs> sorry, that first t- 2K is supposed to be the warm-up in the marathon. but you know, And then making you do a marathon before you do your marathon as well. I know mentally that's a good thing, but he's, uh, uh, yeah, you've got, obviously it works because I look at you, you're a sub three marathoner, and I don't doubt that he'll program like a super successful um sort of like campaign for you to do Kepler and, and Old Ghost, if that's what you're Yeah, doing. well, he's, he's um <clears throat> he, like he's, I, I don't think he's, he's got much running history himself, but he's got like a science degree and he's very analytical about things. And the stuff that he said, he, he's said and he's done with me, it just, it just does work. Yeah, um, totally. It's, it's phenomenal. And I'll look at the app and I'll, and I'll say, oh, mate, I can't run 20K at that pace. And he's like, well, you can because we did the testing and the testing said you can. Oh, I love so, it. He said, I don't know, maybe you're right and science is wrong. No, No, do you know what? Like evidence is the science and it's a human experience, right? It's like kind of bringing them together and you're like the product of both of them. So you're in good hands. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Mickey. I, I appreciate it. Uh, you are welcome. Now, finally, just to sort of finish up, Dom, because I'm, I'm mindful of time. Um, 
what else is on the cards for you this year and in, in the next year? Obviously, you've got your running podcast, which is awesome. What else can we sort of expect from you? Perhaps another book. I, I, yeah, I, I, I always said I wouldn't do another book, but I had a meeting about one a couple of weeks ago. And I, I feel like now, now that I'm not... Um, you know, doing doing breakfast and morning radio hours. First of all, I've got a bit more energy and I've also got a bit more time. So maybe another book. Um, but otherwise, um, just focusing on the podcast. It's actually, I thought the, the podcast would be um, just a passion project, but it actually takes a bit more work than what you think, doesn't it, Mickey? Well, it does, <laughs> although I have the easy job of just standing here and it's Barry that does all the editing in the background. He's one that spends yeah. hours on it each week. So I'm, yeah, you just need to get yourself a good sound engineer there, Dom. I'm sure you right. already do. Hey, Barry, Barry, send me an email and uh, I'll, I'll pay you a tiny bit more than what Mickey's paying you. Um, <laughs> that is no, I'm, 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 loving, I'm loving the podcast though. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm getting to meet some really cool people and share some really cool stories. And it's, um, I don't know, I, I um, over the years have suffered from this, this thing called imposter syndrome. And I think, mm. I, think, I think a lot of us, especially New Zealanders, like suffer from that. So I, I was just like riddled with self-doubt about whether I could do it because it's um it's a very different sort of broadcasting to what I was doing on you know breakfast radio where it's sort of like I don't know it's kind of like fart jokes really and very short very short concise conversations with with people um, so to sit down with someone and chat with them for an hour about their their life story and their connection with running and stuff it's been it's it's so enjoyable mm. I'm enjoying it so so much so. If I can make enough money out of that that I don't have to go back and get a real job, then oh, um, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'll be the go. But yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm loving podcasting. Actually, I'm finding podcasting like like the running thing that we talked about it before. It's a really good community. Anyone else that's got a podcast that is um, well ahead of, of what I'm doing, they're, they're so helpful in sharing their tips and their experiences. It's neat. That's amazing. That's so good, Dom. And now, um, what just to sort of finish up, what um, sort of books are you reading? What podcasts are you listening to? So where are you? Yeah, what what are those things that um, sort of keep you inspired on a day by day basis? Um, oh God, I, I'd like I, I want to be a better reader than what I am. I'm very good at buying books and then uh, <laughs> flicking through them on the first day and then not reading them. I've got a massive, massive collection of books, but I found um, Audible really good now with getting audio books, and I I just listen to. Um, Real positive stuff, actually, like like a lot of Jay Shetty. Um, there's a UK, UK one called um, the High Performance Podcast. Oh, yes. um, another one called Diary of a CEO. Um, a, a little bit of Joe Rogan, depending on who he's got on. Yeah, but yeah, I, I just like to fill my cup up with really good stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I, I do that while I'm running as well. Like a lot of people find that really weird that you could listen to spoken word while you're running, but once you oh, get no. used to it and, and get in the zone of doing it, it's 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 a bloody great way to absorb information. I agree. And in fact, I've heard that you get smarter if you do that because you're sort of, you're engaging your brain and your body at the same time and you get that sign of synergy, right? Mm. That's an yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. If you get an opportunity, I would absolutely recommend to read um, Let Your Mind Run by Dina Castor. I think you'd really love it for the running okay. aspect, but also her positive psychology sort of information. So I really recommend that. And I actually just finished reading uh, Run the Mile You're In by Ryan Hall. And so, oh, Ryan Hall. Ryan, yeah, he's, he's a beast, like the fastest American runner ever, yeah. Yeah, totally. And look, part, it's sort of like half scripture and half memoir because he's very sort of spiritual. Yeah. Um, but I found it an amazing book. And, and he was recently on a podcast, Peter Atia, The Drive. So um, and that's another um, um, awesome podcast. But it's well worth a listen on another run if you're wanting some inspiration. Yeah. Like Ryan has it all there. I'll, I'll check it out. Have you seen photos of him recently? Mate, oh, my God, what a transformation. <laughs> yeah, so for anyone that doesn't know Ryan Hall, he was um, like he, he looked like a good marathon runner. Like he, he, he Actually, he kind of looked unwell, didn't he? He was that lean. Yeah. And I think his, his body was breaking down, and that's why he retired. And uh, since then, he's like transformed himself into like a, like a, a weightlifter, and he's just, mm. he's just massive. 
like yeah, probably maybe maybe two and a half times the weight he was when he was running. Yes. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, he totally is. And in fact, he at that weight, he ran seven marathons in seven continents in seven days. And he describes it both in the podcast, uh, Peter Atiyah's podcast, and also in his in his book as well. And funny, he, he decided whilst when he sort of jumped on that opportunity, because he'd run no longer than like three miles or something. Um, oh, after and, his retirement. After his retirement, yeah. yeah like yeah. So he'd just do real casual jogs. And then he thought, well, I could train eight months and be completely miserable for eight months to get myself in a position to do this or, or I'll just have a really hard week so he's like ah oh, screw it I'll just have a really hard week and I love that it, like do what makes you happy right even if you have that yeah. uh, horrendous week at the end it's way better than just suffering for nine months anyway yeah oh, I love it I love it oh thanks for that I'll, I'll definitely check that out I love Ryan Hall yeah, yeah awesome beast. Awesome, Dom. Well, hey, thank you so much for your time this morning. I really appreciate it. And um, uh, people can find you, Dom Harvey NZ, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Or if, if, if you, wherever you get your podcast, if you look for Runners Only, search Runners Only or Dom Harvey, um, yeah, you'll find it there. But yeah, um, hey, thanks, thanks, Mickey. And lovely to, lovely to meet your community today. You've done a great job. Oh, lovely. Thank you, Dom. See you later. Bye. I love your work. All right, team, hopefully you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed having a chat with Dom. Such a great guy, and I really appreciated his uh, the time that he spent uh, chatting to me. Next week on the podcast, we have a conversation with uh, Dr. Bill Harris, who is the world expert in omega-3 fatty acids, and we have a great conversation, so look out for that next week. Also, if you're interested in New Zest Clean Lean Protein, you can head over to their website www.newzest.co.nz and with Mickey 20 you get a sweet 20% discount on any of their products. So if you're in the market for a protein powder that is one of the best products around, absolutely go to newzest.co.nz for your protein requirements. Until next week though team, catch me over on Facebook at Mickey Willardin Nutrition. Twitter and Instagram at Mickey Willardin or on my website mickeywillardin.com where you can sign up to a meal plan, book a one-on-one -on -one consult with me or check out the latest on my blog. All right team, you have a great week. See you later.